Suppose you find yourself in the market for a new house. You view a lot of properties and finally find one that seems to meet your needs and price range. This house has a wide selection of modern amenities, including a state-of-the-art heating and cooling system. You're quite pleased at the prospect of the impending purchase. However, you notice when you enter the basement, there is a hopelessly obsolete wood-burning stove rooted into the foundation. The stove doesn't work. It's not connected to anything, and the door is welded shut. There is no way to burn fuel inside it. It appears that removing it would require expensive alterations to the structure, which would be more trouble than they're worth. In addition, when inspecting the outside of the building, you find this marking in the concrete. After all this, you speak to an alarmingly perky real estate agent, who assures you that this house was constructed just this year, and that you would be the first owner ever. This is analogous to what evolutionary biologists encounter when they study living organisms. This analogy represents a powerful argument dismantling notions of intelligent design proposed by modern superstitionists. And yet, despite the consensus of virtually all working biologists, nearly 40% of the American public believes in some form of creationism or intelligent design hypothesis. Among the many demonstrable refutations of these ideas is the record of evolution left behind by pseudogenes. This excerpt from the Cassiopeia Project provides a brief description. Another type of structure found in the genome is called a pseudogene. It is basically a gene that in some time in the past had errors occur in its regulatory sequence and quit functioning. Since these structures have no current function, the only reason multiple species would carry this pseudogene is common inheritance. There are very many examples of pseudogenes shared between primates and humans. One is the psi eta globin gene, a hemoglobin pseudogene. It is not shared by all mammals, only the primates. And in primates, it is found in the exact same chromosomal location with the same mutations that destroyed its ability to function as a protein coding gene. So we've known for decades about these genes in which the normal machinery whereby genetic information is written into proteins is broken by mutations. Not entirely unlike an envelope with incorrect address information, the post office will be unable to deliver. Certain sequence changes in a gene due to mutation will prevent cellular machinery from processing it. This is highly relevant to creationism debates due to the common superstitionist tactic of attributing genetic similarity to the premise of a common designer. Most of us have heard the argument, common design means common designer as in the case of the similarity of DNA. But mistakes in the genetic code reveal how and why this argument fails. When we study these lines of evidence, patterns begin to emerge relevant to evolution. So what does all this mean in the real world? This knowledge allows us to answer one of the mysteries of the ages. Why do cats eat meat? Is it because Yahweh made them that way? Let's consider another possibility. Cats, in addition to many other carnivores, have the same complement of taste buds as humans do, but deactivated by mutations. Why should these carnivorous animals have these dead genes, which leave them unable to taste sweet flavors the way you and I can. If cats, seals, and dolphins, as described in this paper, did not evolve from an omnivorous ancestor, why should they have broken copies of taste genes traceable to a common non-cat source? Unsurprisingly, there are numerous other examples. Whales, for instance, with well-known vestigial anatomical traits and dead genes. Whales are ironically popular in the creation-evolution debate, perhaps as a result of the fact that their transition to aquatic life is among the best characterized sequences in the fossil record, perhaps creating a motivation to attack it. 
Undoubtedly the largest animals on Earth, whales are remarkable creatures with remarkable adaptations. But let's consider some of what they can't do. Take a deep breath. Don't forget to stop and smell the roses. This is something toothed whales, including dolphins, will never experience. Most species of odontocetes have absolutely no sense of smell. Let's find out why not. Smell genes, known as odorants, create proteins attached to nerve endings in the nose, stimulated in the presence of particular odors, much like a lock and key, and they provide a roadmap of evolution. In the case of whales, these odorant genes have been largely deactivated but are still detectable, which makes sense in light of the fact that the blowhole is used only for breathing. Tooth whales can survive perfectly well without a sense of smell. Yet strangely, we find a genetic record showing that they once had an olfactory sense. Here's a paper comparing olfactory receptor genes in fish with aquatic mammals, which reveals important differences. Fish use class 1 odorants to smell underwater. Mammals, like you and me, use class 2 odorants to smell in air. Guess which type whales and dolphins have? They have class 2, of course, but the genes don't work. Non-functional pseudogenes not producing any receptors able to smell anything. And yes, in case you were wondering, there are still more animals that illustrate this point, like this rooster and the 22 bones he shares with dinosaurs and no other creatures. Not to mention over 30 species of feathered dinosaurs in the fossil record, but this video isn't about fossils. However, it is about teeth, a hen's tooth to be precise. The reason why they are so rare is because the gene to grow them was knocked out by mutation, but it is in fact still there and can be turned on by geneticists. Which is just what happened in this colored x-ray of a chicken. The gene Talpid 2 causes the growth of alligator-like teeth in birds when activated according to a research summary in the Scientific American. So why would an intelligent designer need to give modern birds dead genes for the same sort of teeth as creatures they share a common ancestor with, according to evolutionary theory. Going back further, it becomes easier to trace patterns of common descent. If you're listening to this, I'll assume you're a mammal. And ironically, that means you share something in common with birds. Not to mention the platypus. Specifically, a nourishing type of molecule known as vitelligenins. They're popular throughout the animal kingdom as a way to nurture young while growing in eggs. How curious that modern mammals would share the genes to make them with our feathered friends, not to mention our scaly ones. Whoops, there's a problem! Yours have been deactivated by mutations in a gradual loss of function. And here's research that describes the process. Non-mammals depend on vitelligenins, but humans have placentas and milk. However, our vitelligenin genes were lost 30 to 70 million years ago. But strangely, they were still detectable by researchers. Screening tests of dogs and humans revealed wreckage of these genes common to both species, not to mention chickens, for some reason. Why would an intelligent designer grant all mammals dead chicken genes to make egg yolk we don't use? But naturally, some do try to explain. Some apologists, such as Answers in Genesis, attempt to obfuscate the issue by claiming we don't know what pseudogenes really do. Others have evidence that certain pseudogenes may play a role supporting the transcription of other working genes. These possibilities embolden intelligent design advocates with the assumption that the war god of the ancient Hebrews designed pseudogenes with some loving purpose in mind that underscores a brilliant spiritual truth we have yet to discover. But while pseudogenes are inactive under normal circumstances, we can glean important insights from what happens when we lift the lid on the mystery and explore the consequences of an activated pseudogene. Mistakes happen, and just as mutations can thwart the normal transcription of a gene, other mistakes can turn it back on. Well, here is a brilliant spiritual truth to consider. Cancer. In this article, we find empirical evidence that when a particular pseudogene becomes activated, the likely result is thyroid cancer. Two versions of this gene are shown here. 
BRAF1 is a functional component of a signaling cascade, BRAF2 is a pseudogene, and when activated it creates a high probability of thyroid carcinomas as well as benign goiters. The researchers conclude that pseudogene activation is an important triggering step in the initiation of full-blown thyroid cancer. Couldn't an intelligent designer smart enough to fine-tune the cosmos and every living thing in it figure out a way to leave BRAF2 out and spare us the tumors? Perhaps the intelligent designer has an inordinate fondness for goiters. But there's more. Who's up for some brain cancer? That's what happens if the Cyp10 pseudogene is accidentally activated. Astrocytic tumors, shown here in red, represent a type of brain cell interstitial to the neurons. Researchers found it to be a processed pseudogene wrongfully activated with carcinogenic consequences. If the Cyp10 pseudogene is expressed, it provided an alternative route to brain cancer as if we needed another one. Thanks a lot, intelligent designer. But returning to our original example with the impending home purchase, despite all evidence to the contrary, the alarmingly perky real estate agent still insists that the house she's selling you is only one year old, because she has an old book which can't be wrong and it tells her so. So how do we know that these findings concerning pseudogenes are truly indicative of evolution as the most likely outcome? Stay tuned for part two as the pattern unfolds.